morning, everyone. Glad to see you. Brian is, uh, I think he's in Niagara Falls with his son, his youngest son, Canaan, on a basket, they're having their basketball trip, and so he sends his greetings. He did not send me a joke this morning, so I took the liberty. <laughs> of, it is dangerous. Normally I can blame him. But my daughter and I like puns, so I thought I would uh, have some fun with you. I just burned 2,000 calories, and that's the last time I leave brownies in the oven while I nap. <laughs> Most people are shocked when they find out what a bad electrician I am. My girlfriend broke up with me, so I took her wheelchair. Guess who came crawling back next week? <laughs> that's my favorite one. Yeah, it is on video. We, we'll cut this part out. About a month before he died, my uncle had his back covered in lard. After that, he went downhill fast. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. You, some of you know this one. The first computer, you know how far back the first computer dates? To Adam and Eve, it was an apple with limited memory, just one bite and everything crashed. Okay, good. That's good enough. We'll stop now. Please stop. Yes, thank you. All right, glad you're here for team. Um, we're uh, focusing on this, this very interesting theme this morning, um, the influence of love. Uh, I want to show you a clip, a clip from a movie that I love, uh, but th I'm guessing you'll see it and wonder what the heck this clip has to do with love. You said you wanted to know how to get to Kaboom. Do you really want to get him? You see what I'm saying? What are you prepared to do? Everything within the law. And then what are you prepared to do? If you open the ball on these people, Mr. Nash, you must be prepared to go all the way. Because they won't give up the fight until one of you is dead. I want to get Capone. I don't know how to get him. You want to get Capone? Here's how you get him. He pulls a knife. You pull a gun. He sends one of yours to the hospital. You send one of his to the morgue. That's the Chicago. That's how you get Capone. Now, you want to do that? Are you ready to do that? I'm making you a deal. Do you want this deal? I have sworn to put this man away with any and all legal means at my disposal, and I will do so. It's a coward. Do you know what a blood oath is, Mr. Ness? Yes. Good. Because you just took one. I'm not sure the Lord hates a coward when you're planning to put one in the morgue. It's in the Bible, but, you know, Sean Connery. <laughs> you get the idea. That's the movie The Untouchables. And that little conversation about the Chicago way. It's interesting to me. I thought the Chicago way was about corrupt elections for mayor, but apparently I was wrong. You might be thinking, what does that movie clip have to do with love, the way of love? Well, clearly, Sean Connery has worked on, if you know the story, he's, the, he's a beat cop from Chicago, and he's been recruited by Elliot Ness. And boy, does, doesn't Kevin Costner look like a different person? That's, all, that's an old movie now. Anyway, he's uh, been recruited by him to help get uh, this, the, the Al Capone, you know the story. And he's trying to teach him, you got, you got to fight different. There's a different way in Chicago if you're going to go after these people, a different way. And that's really at the heart of this. Jesus is teaching us a different way. And there's a couple of meanings that hopefully that clip will make, make clear to us. Let's read Matthew 5, 38 to 48. This is from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Those three chapters we call them the Sermon on the Mount. It's unlikely that that whole, all three chapters were one continuous discourse. Some of it likely was, chapter 5, 6, and 7. I think what we have there is more like a best of Jesus teaching, kind of put together. But here you've got this section of his discourse. He's teaching his disciples and the crowds that are listening in about a different way. And he begins this with this phrase, you've heard it said, which he uses over and over and over again to highlight how his way is different. You've heard that it was said, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. 
Give to the one who asks, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus is showing his disciples, or teaching his disciples and us a different way, the way of love. It's what the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, which read at almost every wedding, you know, we call it the love chapter. He says, I will show you a more excellent way, the way of love, to be contrasted with the Chicago way. Before we can talk about the way of love, let's talk about what love is. It's a misunderstood and misused term all the time in our culture. The biblical definition of love has nothing to do with your emotional state, how you feel in a moment. We say that kind of thing. I love you with all my heart. I really, we use love to describe how we feel. The biblical definition of love might be defined this way. It's the fixed desire for the other person's ultimate good, regardless of how you feel in a moment. So my steady desire for your ultimate good, even if it costs me something, cost Jesus his life, regardless of how you feel in a given moment. That's love. So when Jesus says, love someone, love your neighbor, love your enemies, he's saying, have a fixed desire and willing to sacrifice for their ultimate good, regardless of how you feel in a moment. Just take your marriage for a minute, guys. If you only, quote unquote, loved your wife when you felt loving toward her, And I'm not talking about romantic love. I'm just saying if you only acted toward her in loving ways when you felt like it, how how would your marriage be? Better or worse? (laughs) You don't want to answer. You'd have a crappy marriage if you only did it when you felt like it. The point is, we're to serve her even when we don't feel like it. The fixed desire for her ultimate good even when I don't feel like it or regardless of how I feel or even if it costs me something. And that's true. Jesus says apply that to your enemies, which is a, a crazy radical thing to say. First thing we see I want to talk to you about is the law of revenge. You saw it there in the, in the clip. He says the Chicago way is revenge, which is he pulls a knife, you pull a gun. He puts one of yours in the hospital, you put one of his in the morgue. You, you go beyond. And I, I read a study from about the Stanford University Sociological Research Project uh, in the mid-1980s where subjects were paired up in twos. And they were similar in, so, in socioeconomic and ethnic backgrounds. So it wasn't there, there, was, there were similarities, someone like you. And the idea was that um, you, the first person put their finger in this contraption and the other person was to give them a certain amount of, they were given, a cer- they, they were given, not by the other person, by a uh, controller, a certain amount of pressure that caused pain. Not severe pain, but a little bit of pain. And then they were asked to give, the, to give their partner the same experience. And 100% of the time, the person that had received it from the controller gave more pain uh, th- than they received to the person across the table from them. 100% of the time. Why? Not because they're all mean and cruel, but because pain, uh, perceived pain is o- it's often, it's perceived greater than what's sent. You always experience your pain as greater than somebody else's. You always experience it and so that th- they saw it 100% of the time. I read a book uh, a couple years ago called Shake Hands with the Devil by Romeo Delare. He was the UN security general in Rwanda during the Great Genocide. And it's a, kind of, a, it's, a, it's a historical account from a guy who was on the ground there, and it's a memoir, and he ended up trying to take his life after that over the extreme crushing guilt of what he witnessed and his inability to stop it. In the last couple chapters, he has kind of an, a, it's really an anatomy of human evil. See, what he witnessed was years of tribal warfare and, you know, generations of the Chicago way. You pull a knife, we pull a gun. They kill one of your family, you kill their whole family. And there was this deep, ingrained desire to do greater harm to the other that was just part of the fabric of the culture. And it was the inability, not only of himself, but of the world, so, uh, world's militaries and governments and leaders to face what was actually happening there, what was escalating. Sociologists call this the law of escalating conflict or violence. It is the natural human response unless something else is injected into the system. It's the way it always goes. Somebody hurts you, and your desire is to inflict more on them. Even if you don't intend more, it always ends up being more. And that's how things go. Second thing I want you to see is the law of reciprocity. The Old Testament Mosaic law 
uh, which is Jesus, when he says, you've heard it said, he's quoting out of the Old Testament. The Latin term for this is lex talionis, the law of retaliation. Uh, it set limits on how far you can go. So, it, for example, in Leviticus 24 and Deuteronomy 19, Jesus er, is quoting from these two chapters of the Old Testament. And he says, you've heard it said eye for eye, tooth for tooth. That sounds a bit like, you know, God is okay with mutilation of the other person if they hurt you. There's no place where we see ever in the, in the Old Testament this law applied to, the, to individual revenge or individual response. So the Old Testament law was not that if you injure my eye, I have the legal right to go and take a, you know, do you, you ever see the old Robin Hood movie, Kevin Costner? He might carve his eye out with a spoon. Why a spoon, cousin? Because it'll hurt more. It's dull, you twit, right? You ever see that? Is that just me? Anyway, so, <laughs> well, now you know. Like, he's, it doesn't mean that I can go now and, extra and personally extract some, your eye or cut off your hand. It was, a, it was a way of describing limits put on retaliation that could be used in the judicial system, which was already set up in Deuteronomy 18. So they had a judicial system with the priests. We read about Moses doing this when they were wandering the wilderness. And the law that he was to apply was the principle of limited retaliation. The punishment should fit the crime sort of thing. So it was actually a way of restraining the law of escalating violence. It was God's way of, in the, of this, in this ancient culture. Now remember, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt for 40 years. Slaves were pretty harshly treated. They had unintentionally absorbed the behavior of the culture around them. And now they're on their own. And God's saying there's a different way. We're going to put limits on how far this can go. And by the way, it's not you individually that can apply this. It's, it's a law that I'm giving to those that I, leaders over you I've established. So when Jesus says, I tell you, you've heard, you've heard it said eye for eye, tooth for tooth, but I tell you something different. He's not saying there's no, there sh we should never have any civil punishment or that we should never defend ourselves. He's saying don't take this law and make it into your personal revenge because the Pharisees of his day had done that. They had interpreted this as you could seek personal vengeance, personal retribution for injuries. So Jesus is drawing a distinction between civic or government punishment and our personal call to love our neighbor and even our enemy as ourselves. Say, so leave that to them, but you have a, there's a different call on your life. In Jesus' day, this is what was going on. He's separating that, those responsibilities. He, God never intended this to be about interpersonal relationships. And he goes beyond this, and he tells us to love our enemies. Now, that's a bit of a shocking thing. Loving our family, our friends, our neighbors sometimes comes pretty personally and naturally to us, doesn't it? Loving our enemies? Not so much. Who wants to cause, the, we want to cause them the same pain they caused, that, that they caused you. I, now, I've heard the criticisms of this passage saying that this standard is impossible to live up to, that this forbids self-defense, that this is just... An example of why you can't follow. In fact, Reinhold Niebuhr, a famous American theologian who others have quoted. In fact, I've, I've heard, I heard Jimmy Carter, Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, different speeches quote the principles of Niebuhr, who, who said that this was uh, unrealistic to live this way. Is it? Is it unrealistic to live this way, according to Jesus' law? We all look for loopholes, actually, because we think violence comes with, with a disclaimer. There's a reason why it's necessary. But I'm going to talk about turning the other cheek for a minute. He gives that one, right? He gives that example here, doesn't he? He says, if, if um, anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn them the other cheek also. So I need a volunteer. Can I have a volunteer up here? Come on, Dean. Come on up here. I'm smaller than I used to be, Dean, so it won't hurt too much. Look at Dean. It's so nimble. Okay. So if someone slaps you on the right cheek, so well, Dean can do it to me. If he slaps me on the right cheek, he would use his left hand, right? So, but he, wouldn't, he actually wouldn't do that in the ancient culture because your left hand was anybody used for other things. Anybody know? Yeah. Wiping, right? So, th that, th so you wouldn't use your left hand. You'd use your right hand. That was the hand you used for work and other things. And Dean would have to hit me on the right cheek. How would he do it? He'd have to backhand me. He'd have to hit me that way. So he'd reach across and hit me this way. Right? Oh, Dean, take it easy. Right? That's, it, it's, it's the slap of an insult. The slap of, of a superior to an inferior. Is this is the image. We don't always see it that way. That's what Jesus is saying, right? It's a smack across the face to an inferior person. So what does Jesus say? If someone slaps you on the right cheek, boom. Turn to him the other cheek also. What does that mean? Turn this cheek. Now, how is Dean going to hit me in this cheek? He can't do it this way, like a slap of a superior to an inferior, right? What does he have to do? He's going to have to punch me. 
He's going to have to hit me in that cheek. He's going to have to slap me with a direct slap or a punch into this cheek. Now, you see, this is subtle, but I think Jesus is saying something to his audience that we miss. He's saying, if someone treats you as an inferior, looks down on you, what do you do? Do you just take it? Thanks, Dean. Appreciate it, man. Appreciate it. No, no, no slapping. Right? <laughs> he's saying, do you just take it? Do you just get... I think he's saying something interesting. He's saying, yes, we, we don't retaliate. No lex talionis, but we do it a different way. We actually receive that injury in a, in a dignified way, in a way that says, I'm not your inferior, but neither am I going to retaliate against you. Kind of when Jesus, when Pilate says, don't you know I could have you killed? What does Jesus say? Actually, you can't do anything to me unless God allows it. But he allows it. Jesus allows it. So he's saying, I get hit on this cheek by someone who's looking down on me. It's a, it's a metaphor. Turn the other cheek. Meaning, I'm not your inferior, but I will allow, I, I will take, I will walk the way of Jesus. It's almost like, put that person in a position of just, like you display what's really going on. For example, when he says, if somebody asks you to go one mile, you should go two miles. Some of you might know what this is referring to. Roman soldiers who occupied Israel of the day had the legal right to compel any citizen or, not, or occupied person to carry their pack, which weighed in excess of 75 pounds for a Roman soldier, legionnaire, to carry it up to one mile. You know that Romans invented mile markers? You can see them around the places that Rome occupied today for this reason. You can carry my pack for a, and, and no Jew would ever walk alongside a Roman in the same direction. They would go the other direction when they saw them. So the idea would be this, you know, you'd be walking along, somebody passed you, the Roman soldier says, hey, you, carry my pack. And you were compelled by law to go one mile. You had to. It was, the, it was the law. So what does Jesus say? Go the extra mile. But it's actually two miles for you if you're carrying that mile. You've got to walk one mile the way you're going and then turn around and walk the mile back from the direction you just came. So he's telling you to go four miles, right? Two miles. But in that second mile, what's the difference? Hmm? It's not legally required. Now you are making the decision, I will not just do what I have to do. I'll go beyond that. Now you put the Roman soldier in the position of, wait a second, I... He can't compel you to go that far. He could actually get into trouble for compelling a citizen of Rome, if he were a citizen, to go more than that mile. And now you have, now you're, now you're the one that in a way is serving, but not from a position of, of where you're being mistreated as an inferior, but where you're choosing to do it. Same principle, you get it? The, the tunic and the cloak thing, did you catch that? If someone asks for your tunic, give them your cloak as well. Those were the two garments that the average person owned, a tunic and a cloak. One, to, one was your, well, your shirt, basically. The other was your overcoat that you would sleep in if you slept outdoors. You'd wrap yourself in when it was warm. That was your, your cloak. Jesus says, if somebody asks for your, your tunic, your cloak, excuse me, give them your tunic as well. Basically, strip down. Somebody asks for one of your two garments, those people only own those two, right? Then, then you can basically say, here's what's really going on. Take your cloak, your, strip down in front of them as well. From a position of... Not of, I, I have to take this, I'm forced to do this, I just have to do it, but as Jesus did. I allow it, but I don't allow it because I'm being mistreated, I allow it because it's the law of love. It's, a, it's really a radically different thing. He's showing us a different way, which is so different than the law of revenge or even the Old Testament law of reciprocity where we're putting limits on it. These are actually powerful acts of grace and love and non-resistance. He's not trying to destroy our enemies. He's trying to love them. And he's trying to do it through you. Now, here's a question this morning. Who are your enemies? I mean, it's easy when you read this to think, well, okay, Jews and Romans, they were natural enemies. Those who want to, I haven't been backhanded across the face. It's been a while since that happened. I don't know who my enemies are, right? I hope it doesn't happen to you at work, you know? Does that happen to you often? Bill. <laughs> no, probably not. But who, are, who, are, who do you count as, these people are against me. I see them as the problem. I see them as the, the issue in my life. Might be family members, I've had people tell me that. My brother-in-law is the problem. My sister-in-law is the problem. My mother-in-law, right? Is the, maybe it's people you work with, competitors in business. What about in our country? Who are the enemies? You know we're coming up on another election cycle. Have you heard about this? I don't know if you know this. You know how smoothly the last one went, 2016? It really was such a good thing for our country. I felt, you know, who are the enemies? People across the aisle? Well, what, how would you apply the law of love? 
Can you, can you hear Jesus in the church saying, this is, the, this is my way. It's not the Chicago way, but it's my way. And it's radically different than what people see in the world. It's not, it's not going only as far as you have to go because you're required to. It's going beyond. That's the law of love. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay up here, but you don't want to dismiss you for your tables. But just for a minute, have a discussion around your tables. When you, is it easy or hard for you to identify your enemies when you read this passage? And who would they be? Ready? And I'll bring us back together in just a minute. Okay. Oh, thanks. Okay, let me bring us back together for a minute. The word enemy can trip us up, I think. Because most of us don't think of ourselves as having enemies that way. We think about, you know, people that are evil. or. But it simply means people that we feel are against us. You know, uh, sociologists will tell you, you know, the, most, uh, the best predictor of whether or not you will like somebody when you meet someone for the first time? What's that? But do you like yourself? Yeah, do you like yourself? And do you perceive they like you? It's not race. It's not class. It's not, you know, if you, the first time you meet somebody, if you perceive that they like you, that's the best indicator that you would like them. So enemies, just think of it in terms of those, those people we perceive to be against us or that we think that we are against. And our enemy almost always carries some part of our own dark side in them. It's what you see some aspect of a part of yourself that you don't like, to Vince's point, in them. Colin Powell tells a story that when the Soviet Union fell, he realized they had a $500 billion arsenal, the, the 330,000 troops in Germany, this is the U.S., I mean, 
and its entire reason for existing was predicated on the need to fight the Soviet Union. And then the Soviet Union fell. Powell sat across the table from President Gorbachev, and Gorbachev said to him, General, you will have to find a new enemy with a twinkle in his eye. I'm sure you'll find one soon. And we have, both on the national level and the individual level. We do. We almost look for this. We almost subconsciously need people to be against. They're the problem. Jesus is saying, let me tell you about a different way, a different way of thinking, a different way of living. Because God doesn't hate our enemies. He's not against them, even though they and we may be against him sometimes. He loves them. This is why he says God causes his sun to shine on the righteous and the wicked. Right? Can you imagine? Can you drive down the street at harvest time and say that field must belong to a Christian because it's fruitful? You see a bunch of corn that's withering? Ah, there's an atheist. Right? <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Jesus is saying, look, just look at, look, at the, look at the life you've been given, all of you. Do you ever look at people that you know, thumb their nose at God, do their own thing, and live in ways that flaunt his laws, and, and you see that they're, they're doing great in life? And feel like, that doesn't seem fair. My life is hard. The, the Psalms are full of people asking that question. Jesus says God's indiscriminate with his general grace, his blessings. Now, there's coming a, there, there's coming a day when all wrongs will be righted and judgment will come, but he's saying in this life, can you be the same? Can you be gracious to all people? Can you be loving? I read... Uh, the story about during, under the apartheid regime in South Africa, the government was going shanty neighborhood to shanty neighborhood trying to clear them out. They had one particular area that they wanted this land. It was very difficult to you know, displace these people. So they decided to go during the day or when most of the men were gone and working in the fields and few people would be home. Uh, they surprised a bunch of the women and the soldiers came in with the bulldozers and the tanks and they announced that the, the people had five minutes to clear out before the bulldozers came in. Just going to level everything. That's the way they did it. And some of the women rallied together of that little shanty village, and they stripped completely naked and stood in front of the bulldozers. It so wigged out the soldiers that they didn't know what to do, and they just left. In a way, I think Jesus is saying that. Someone wants to bulldoze your house? Take off all your clothes. What? It's a different way of responding. Martin Luther King Jr. said it this way. Through violence, you may murder a murderer, but you cannot murder murder. Through violence, you may murder a liar, but you cannot establish truth. Through violence, you may murder a hater, but you cannot murder hate. Darkness cannot put out darkness. You need light to do that. Jesus is trying to get us to reach for the light, respond with the light in this passage a different way. And my mind, probably like yours, automatically goes to government policies, systems, and that kind of thing. He's talking about you and your heart and my heart, how you see people how you treat people in your life. He's not talking about what the policy should be about incarceration and punishments on the civil level. He's talking about you. He's talking about me. That's what changes the world. That's what makes the greatest impact. It is not who gets elected in 2020. That's important. I have some trepidation about it. I'm sure you do. But that's not what changes the world. It's people who decide there's a different way. There's a different way to live. There's a different way to see. There's a different way to love. So I'm going to give you a breakdown. You have some questions at your tables. Uh, you take your, get some more coffee, donuts, whatever you... I don't, eat, I don't eat donuts anymore, but I used to like them. And then have discussions around your table. After a few minutes, I'll come back up and lead us in prayer. I think we're out of the prayer cards. So if you have a prayer request, just find a scrap of paper and drop it up here, and I'll be happy to include those. Thanks. <laughs>